Good morning from Miami Beach, Dr. John Bennett for Neurosurgical TV. Uh, we're graced with the presence of Michael Lawton, and we'll start right away with you, Huck. Could you please give a proper introduction of Dr. Lawton? Uh, Go ahead, you are. Okay. Hello, Michael Lawton, dear colleagues. I give a short introduction. So, Professor Michael Lawton is working now in Phoenix, Arizona, USA. He's the chairman of Barrow Neurological Institute. He's certainly one of the most important neurosurgeons of these times in the world. He became medical doctor 1990, and after that he was a resident at Barrow Neurological Institute, 91, 97, and the legendary. Sorry. So, how to become a good neurosurgeon? I never saw a person who wanted to be a bad neurosurgeon, as many good role models. Train hard, follow the way Professor Michael Lawton has done as doing. A level of different levels of manual skills and mainly they, they are dependent on the number of repetitions and length of career. That's the old rule that with 10,000 hours of training, you will come to the world top and my rule is that with 10,000 days in operation room, you will be at your best in your surgical, neurosurgical career. Neurosurgery has three parts, operative skills, research, clinical and basic research, and teaching. And Michael Lawton has uh, been teaching all the world with the shaving series, seven aneurysms, seven AVMs, and seven bypasses. And he has also published more than 700 publications, including important textbooks. Until now, he has done amazing 5,000, more than 5,000 cerebral aneurysms and 900 AVM operations, and more than 1,000 cavernomas. 250 of them in the most difficult location in the brainstem. And what is important, he continues his hectic practice. To have that kind of numbers, you have to be excellent neurosurgeon, organizer, surrounded by a good supporting team and the patients and society, and to have a big population. Barrow Neurological Institute is the model for all neurosurgical institutes in the world. You should visit when the world opens there. But this is uh, important. You should train your best young people. They should become better than you. My teacher, late professor Drake was saying, if we cannot find that kind of people, then we wait. One day they will come. And at Barrow, you certainly have found huge number of these people who want to be become better than the older generation. So this is the introduction for Professor Michael Lawton, short introduction because he's so famous and well known. He will speak on the seven bypasses and uh, after the lecture, Subin will lead the discussion. So go on, go on Michael. Thank you, Yuha. Um, can you see my title slide and can you hear me okay? Yeah, perfect. Yes. Perfect. Okay. Well, Yuha, it's always a pleasure to see you. Um, you look well and it's so nice to see that you've um, found a home to continue your passion. Um, well, it's um, early for me in the morning here, so hopefully I don't sound too uh, delirious, but um, I uh, want to talk about bypasses. I think um, for those of you who have an interest in bypass surgery, 
this will be a um, uh, hopefully an interesting talk for you. But even for those who aren't interested in bypass surgery and don't do bypasses, uh, I think it's sort of a, um, a metaphor or a lesson in how maybe you should try and put your own practice together. Um, in line with what Yuha was saying, all of us want to become good neurosurgeons, maybe even great neurosurgeons. And um, the uh, theme of this lecture is um, this is a path to, towards how you can do that, uh, not just related to the topic of bypasses, but with surgery or neurosurgery generally. So um, this is my uh, case volume uh, at last update. You can see that um, I've been able to uh, focus my attention primarily on vascular with my aneurysm AVM and bypass and cavernoma practice. And, um, you know, one of the um, things that's been hardest for me um, lately is this uh, curve to the right. Um, if you look at my aneurysm volume over time, it's, it's steadily climbing and I've reached 5,000 aneurysms. But um, if you look to the curve on the right, what you see is that we've peaked. And um, despite all my efforts to write papers and to do good work, um, I have a practice in aneurysm surgery that's shrinking and not growing. And that's um, very discouraging. Um, uh, it shouldn't be that way. And um, uh, one of my reactions to that is to say, well, um, we need to um, capture all that we've learned um, with all of these cases that have been done. And the way to do that is by writing. Um, writing is um, uh, one of the ways that we become better neurosurgeons because um, it allows us to synthesize all the things we've learned. <coughs> it gives us time to introspect or to look at all of the lessons learned. Um, it allows us to be creative. Um, it's a frustrating process. It's a lonely process. But um, in the end, I've come to this belief that um, it's by writing that we uh, really grow ourselves. And the pen is mightier than the scalpel, which means you can be the best neurosurgeon in the world. But um, if, uh, if nobody knows what you're doing and nobody knows the work that um, you've come to or the ideas that you've come to, then um, all of that work is for naught. So writing has become a passion for me. Um, these are my seven books um, in the seven series. And um, I started with this one because of that curve. I wanted to try and capture those lessons and preserve the art of aneurysm surgery. Um, the seven referred to the seven most common aneurysms. And my feeling was that if we could preserve all of those seven and um, were competent in those seven, that we would be able to deal with the vast majority of aneurysms that walk through our emergency room or our offices. The other idea was that the process of these surgeries could be simplified into steps, um, choreographed steps, just like a dance. And so dancing became the metaphor. The artwork um, with my illustrator then, Ken Probst, was like dance steps, uh, numbering the different maneuvers and walking through the process um, breaking it down piece by piece. So these were some of the um, illustrations. And for a middle cerebral aneurysm like this one, you could really um, understand the operation by going from number one to number two, gaining proximal control number three as you step up uh, the M1 segment here, uh, and then progressing to the other steps, finding the frontal division, working your way down to the aneurysm neck, working across to the other side where this inferior trunk is often hidden, and then figuring out how to place your clip. Um, so that was sort of the idea behind this. And when it came to the more complicated aneurysms, like the giant aneurysms, um, what I began to come to was that um, giant aneurysms were very different. Um, giant aneurysms were something that were not just like a large saccular aneurysm. They were a completely different entity. And I'll show you uh, this case. This is a woman who had this giant middle cerebral aneurysm. I clipped this with the picket fence and you can see here post-operatively how it looked fine, but at five year follow-up, the aneurysm had grown back. So here we are at five years, the 
dysplastic tissue at the base had resulted in a regrowth. And so to fix this, I needed to do a bypass. I put in this high flow bypass. I then took the trunk off of the aneurysm and swung it over. And I created this, what I call a middle communicating artery that joins the frontal and temporal trunks, allows me to distally occlude the aneurysm. And now we've completely reconstructed the uh, circulation distally. So here now is what that aneurysm looks like uh, five years after my initial clipping. This is a view of the cervical carotid artery. So we've got an aortic uh, punch here in the external carotid. We do a nice implantation of the radial artery graft. We tunnel it up back to the sylvian fissure. And now this is the uh, temporal division here on the temporal side of the aneurysm. So this uh, distal end of our graft is being sewn in end to side. And normally when you finish with this anastomosis, this stump here becomes just a dead end. But if you think about it differently, if you repurpose that as a new donor artery, then uh, you can take it off of the aneurysm like I'm showing here. Uh, I'm trapping it, I'm transecting it, and I'm gonna now move it over to the other side, to the frontal trunk. So this dead end now becomes a live donor. And so we can reimplant it. This is now creating our middle communicating artery here, where the artery, um, this is the inside suture line, the artery swings over to the other side. It feeds both um, this artery here and also receives the flow from our high flow graft. And now with those two bypasses in place, we can now complete our distal trapping, which is uh, with this second clip, there are lenticular strides, so I couldn't completely trap but now you see our middle communicating artery and a nice reconstruction of the aneurysm. So what this case shows you is that um, you can clip giant aneurysms, but they're very prone to other problems, uh, in this case, recurrence. And instead, um, if we think about these as a different entity, um, we realize that we need a different strategy and that strategy is bypass. Uh, in my giant aneurysm series, which you can see here on this slide, um, the numbers of bypasses for the giant aneurysms is 44%. And now, um, now that I've sort of come to this way of thinking, um, you know, most of these giant aneurysms, I begin to think of how I'm going to treat them with a bypass strategy as my first resort. So um, I'm going to skip my comments on... Um, uh, this book two on the AVM surgery and jump or continue that theme uh, about uh, bypass with the third book here. And with the third book, um, my goal was to really elevate the art of bypass surgery. Um, and to do that, uh, I wanted to um, do a couple things. One was to develop a, to develop a symbol uh, or a system of symbols to um, translate bypass design into surgical constructs. And um, we really needed tools to capture our, our thoughts, uh, capture our imagination and translate. The second thing was to develop this taxonomy for bypasses. And that's really what the seven bypasses was, was all about. And finally, um, to advance the intracranial to intracranial techniques. Um, the ICIC techniques are ones we're all familiar with, but the ICIC techniques were where I saw the future. And so these are my objectives. And like with the other books, um, I needed a metaphor and the metaphor was architecture. This is the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco where I lived for two decades. Uh, this was one of my morning runs with the sun rising over the city. And um, this is more than just a bridge connecting Marin County with the city of San Francisco. This is really a statement about um, uh, American engineering and ingenuity. This is um, two 750 foot towers. This is 81,000 tons of steel suspended by these almost invisible wires. This is a beautiful construct. This, the cables going from one side to the other back and forth to create the strength of that suspension bridge. They're, they're about, um, nearly 90,000 miles worth of cable. And in the end, what you see is this beautiful statement about um, uh, how um, we're able to, to span the waterway. And uh, it's, it's really um, 
Uh, it could have just been a practical bridge, an ugly bridge, but it turned into this really majestic uh, uh, engineering feat. When we look in New York, we see the Freedom Tower, which has become a symbol of American resilience after the 9-11 attack. Um, and it too is more than just office space. This is a, a statement about our resolve. This is the uh, Basilica La Familia in, um, in Barcelona. And this is uh, Anton Godi's uh, creation using parabolas instead of circular shapes, using these branched columns, these beautiful new constructs that had never been uh, built before. And he was making a statement about what his vision of architect architecture should be. This is Jorn Utzan's uh, Sydney Opera House. And you can see how he used these um, concrete shells and stacked them to make them look like sails on a ship building this uh, symphony hall out into the water so that it looks like a, a boat at sea. And here is uh, Frank Gehry, uh, again in Spain in uh, Bilbao, um, with this, uh, these beautiful abstract forms, these titanium shells around this building that uh, almost create the look of, uh, of fish scales uh, with um, this fish right in the water. So um, the point here is that, um, these architects converted their, their craft from this um, um, uh, practical thing of creating shelter into really expressing themselves and making statements. And I think, um, you know, in neurosurgery, we don't often have the opportunity to do the same thing, but in bypass surgery, we do. And so we can trans, uh, transform our, our craft from plumbing to art. Uh, it becomes a a form of self-expression, um, an expression of creativity and personality, passion, and um, something that really challenges us to achieve perfection. So that's really um, uh, one of the key messages here is I think we can look at all of our practices, whether it's bypass surgery, tumor surgery, or spine surgery, and ask how can we transform what we're doing into something um, more beautiful or, or higher? Um, now, one of the things that um, was important, uh, not only for um, architecture, but for bypass, uh, is this idea of blueprints. Uh, this is the home that my wife, Suzanne, and I built in Phoenix. And, you know, to go from an idea of a home to the actual building of a home, you have to develop blueprints that you can work with the architect, uh, capture your vision, and then translate to the team that constructs the house. And so um, the blueprint becomes a really critical uh, part of that process to translate the idea uh, into a home. And um, in bypass surgery, um, we really didn't have symbols. We really didn't have blueprints. And so one of the things in the book was to create this uh, system of symbols. And this slide just captures that idea where on the left, we have symbols for the different types of anastomoses. We have symbols for the different types of um, bypass grafts. We have symbols for the different types of aneurysm occlusions. Over here on the right, we have the different circulations, the anterior circulation, um, the middle cerebral circulation, basilar circulation, and the pica circulation. And um, we can put these symbols together to, um, to capture our bypass. This is um, a, uh, what we call the Barrow Bypass Coder. It's online on our website. If you have an idea for a new bypass that you've been thinking of, you can go to the site, you can drag over these different elements of the construct, you can put them on the, on the diagram and you can build um, a schematic for the bypass. And not only that, as you build it, uh, it converts or uh, translates it into the code which I'll talk about in just a second. But you can see that um, this becomes a way to create those blueprints. So if you have an idea for a bypass, you can capture that and you can work out you know, the best way to put together this construct, what, what graph to use, how to connect them, uh, what um, uh, anastomosis you're gonna use. And in the end, you end up with a, uh, a schematic that you can share with your residents or your team and uh, take to the OR. Now, um, that's the uh, schematic way to express a bypass, but um, one of the other ways that you can do it is with, um, with code. 
And um, this is a paper that I wrote with um, uh, Anna and with uh, Al Roten, uh, where we completed this alphanumeric system for all of the different segments of the arteries intracranially. Um, Dr. Roten had done this nicely for the cerebral vessels, but not for the cerebellar vessels. So we finished it off. And in the end, we have um, this code where every um, piece of the arterial tree has an alphanumeric. And um, if we put those together in the form of a bypass code, you can see here, we can capture all the different nuances that go into a bypass, which include the side, the donor specifics, the recipient specifics, the type of anastomosis that you do, which is captured within the parentheses here, the technique, whether it's a running continuous suture or an interrupted, whether it's intraluminal sutures or, or um, uh, extra luminal. And all of this stuff gets captured in the bypass code so that when we look at a very complex giant aneurysm like this one, and we put together a bypass like this double reimplantation, we can capture it with this code with just this string of alphanumerics. You can go to the operating room and you can know exactly how to perform this uh, surgery with nothing more than just that. You can also do it with the schematic here if you're more visually uh, inclined, but you can do it with the code and it really clarifies um, uh, the instructions, but also uh, helps communicate what exactly you've done uh, with your bypass. So this was all part of the process of um, taking um, bypass surgery and, um, and uh, standardizing it in the way that we have with blueprints in architecture. Now here are the seven bypasses. Um, on the top of the table, we have the ECIC bypasses that use scalp arteries. Uh, below that, we have the ECIC interpositional bypasses, um, like the, uh, the high flow vessels or bypasses from the, from the cervical carotid vessels. These next four are the ICIC bypasses. Those are reimplantation, in situ bypass, reanastomosis and the ICIC interpositional bypasses. These are what I, what I refer to as the intracranial to intracranial bypasses. And lastly, number seven is the combination for any aneurysm where you need more than one bypass. Um, this is a combination that brings any of these two together. Um, now, um, when you're trying to put all this together, we, we need a little bit more speci specificity on the aneurysm uh, classification. So for this, as an example, these are all middle cerebral artery aneurysms, but some middle cerebral artery aneurysms are pre-bifurcation, some are at the bifurcation, and some are post-bifurcation. And if they're post-bifurcation, they can be uh, sylvian, they can be insular, they can be opercular. So there are variations here so it's very important to figure out exactly what type of aneurysm you're dealing with and classify it accordingly. Uh, once you have it, you can then um, put all your different aneurysms across the top. You can put all of your seven bypasses across the side here, and you create this menu of options for uh, whatever aneurysm you're dealing with. You can, you can go down the grid here and you can look at the different options that are available and make your choices um, based upon your options. Uh, I also put together these algorithms that can ask critical questions and help guide you to that, that uh, final decision based upon, for example, uh, whether it's a bifurcation aneurysm, whether it's ruptured, and um, uh, how many trunks it has, one or two trunks. So um, here's an example. This is a um, uh, a giant aneurysm of the middle cerebral artery. Um, as with all of these middle cerebral aneurysms, our first steps are gonna be to uh, split the sylvian fissure, to expose the anatomy. And here, our aneurysm is over here. This is the frontal division on the frontal side of the sylvian fissure. This is the temporal division on the temporal side. And you can see how these trunks are completely separated and uh, require bypass. So for this one, I'm gonna use um, the A1 anterocerebral artery as my donor. So it's all intracranial. The A1 is just to the side of the carotid terminus here. And so it allows us to use 
a donor that's right within our surgical field that doesn't require a separate incision in the neck and a tunnel down to the, to the neck. So here um, we're performing our arteriotomy. Um, in the interest of time, I'm gonna just jump ahead here. This is finishing up the uh, anastomosis here to this back wall. And you can see that the A1 is an excellent donor because the flow is drawing right from the carotid terminus. So it's very high flow and it gives us a very good uh, donor source for the flow. Uh, now, once we have that in place, we can take our graft up the sylvian fissure. We can run it alongside the frontal division. And with this um, linear arteriotomy, we can do a side-to-side reimplantation or this side-to-side -side anastomosis that's going to join these two vessels. And that way, the graft can immediately donate to the frontal division. So you see here with our anchoring stitches, we're gonna bring these two arteries together. Uh, you'll see this is a running uh, intraluminal suture. So we're running right down the inside of both arteries here. And that brings our graft right next to our uh, recipient so that the uh, frontal trunk can immediately perfuse itself. So here is the second suture line uh, coming down the outside with an extraluminal suture. And once that's in place, we can now uh, readjust our clips. We can immediately perfuse that trunk with the graft. And you see how the other end of the graft can now uh, continue on and we can use that to go to the other side of the aneurysm. So this now is sewing it to the temporal division. This is an anchoring stitch. And what you'll notice here is this will be an intraluminal suturing technique. This is important later in the talk. Uh, but you'll see it's an intraluminal suture technique sewing on the inside. It allows me to shorten the graft to bring these together. And so this end of the graft donates to the temporal division. And you can see I'm just running that suture around from one side to the next. This is finishing up the intraluminal suture here. And we'll jump ahead. Uh, now the anastomosis is done. We can come off with our clips. We can place our permanent trapping clips. The aneurysm is now isolated. You can see here, uh, there's no flow in the aneurysm. There's good flow in the bypass. Our aneurysm over here is completely dark. And now we can deflate the aneurysm, completely dead, and the bypass is doing its job. So um, here is the final clip closure. I um, uh, had to readjust the clips to save these little lenticular stripe perforators down here uh, coming off the back of the aneurysm, but everything flows nicely here on the uh, yellow 560. And here is an overview showing the bypass. So um, beautiful bypass, nice result for this gentleman and uh, a, an unusual combination bypass. So um, that's a, an example of how um, the code, the blueprints and all come together to uh, do an unusual bypass. So um, I'm gonna talk about now just evolving the, the craft. You know, how do we keep this moving forward? And I'm gonna talk about ICA bypass. I'm gonna talk about anterocerebral artery bypass. I'm gonna talk about fourth generation bypass and I'll finish with the middle communicating artery. So um, when I wrote seven bypasses, I really didn't even talk about um, uh, ICA bypass because the other four territories were, were so uh, much more common. Um, but you know, um, one of the things that occurred to me was that if there was validity to that framework of uh, seven bypasses, that I should be able to apply it to anywhere. And um, the ICA was no exception. So. Um, um, I since uh, have done all seven bypasses in the ICA territory. This illustration shows you pictures of those. And I'll just show you uh, an example. I'll skip this for now. But here uh, is an example of an ICA thrombotic aneurysm with pressure on the pons. The lady had mass effect. So what she needed was a decompressive operation that eliminated that mass effect. So what we're doing here is a retrosigmoid craniotomy. You're looking at the seventh and eighth nerve. Here's the fifth nerve. And our aneurysm is right in this infratrigeminal uh, triangle. 
uh, that is uh, um, uh, showing that ICA aneurysm. This is the cerebral artery. And um, here, what we have is the ICA and the pica, which come together uh, in, in parallel. So the ICA and the pica can be brought together with this side to side anastomosis so that pica becomes the donor, ICA becomes the recipient. And the intention here is to use that bypass to then revascularize the ICA territory and then trap the aneurysm. So this is our first stitch going in. This brings Ica here together with Pica over here. This is our second anchoring suture uh, on the other end of the arteriotomies. Here's an entrance stitch that brings those two together. It brings the needle inside. And now we can run that interluminal suture line inside the artery once again. So this is an interluminal technique. We run it all the way to the other side. We perform an exit suture. We can tie it down and there's a view of the inside of the artery. Now we can do that second suture line, which is extra luminal. And um, this completes the anastomosis. So at this stage, we've got um, ICA connected to PICA so that we can now um, uh, uh, do the real portion of the operation, which is our aneurysm trapping. So here now is the overview. There's our bypass. And now we can go up here. This is now a view of the aneurysm. Here's Ica coming out the distal end. This is the sixth nerve draped over the shoulder of Ica. This is the seventh and eighth nerve complex. This first clip will be a distal clip that closes the outflow. Now we turn our attention to the inflow and going above the seventh and eighth nerve into this um, infratrigeminal triangle. You can see the basilar trunk. If you look right here in this corner here, you'll see just a little bit of a stump of the, uh, of the ICA right there for our proximal clip. This allows our trapping clip to go in there. And now the aneurysm is completely uh, isolated. So we've got um, the aneurysm trapped. There's no longer any flow. And now I can go in I can open the aneurysm and I can do a thrombectomy and uh, take the mass off of the pons. So here now is the um, final overview. You can see our bypass down in this space here. You can see our trapping up here. It's all a simple retrosigmoid craniotomy. And now with the IC green, what you're gonna see is the flow going from our communication here upward to all the perforators to the pons um, with uh, this simple bypass. So um, another example for an ICA bypass is just this one. I'll, I'll show you a brief clip here. This was a mycotic aneurysm, distally located on ICA. Um, you could do an <laughs> occipital artery to ICA bypass for this, um, but uh, I wanted to do um, uh, something different. So I'm gonna excise this aneurysm here, which you see, and um, I'm going to um, do an end-to-end -end re -anastomosis. So our, temp, our uh, trapping clips go on. We can excise the mycotic tissue here. And because there was some redundancy in the arteries, uh, there was enough room to bring them together end to end. So the pathology is coming out here. You can see how deep this is. This is the seventh and eighth nerve. The sixth nerve is right here. And so this is literally all the way down at the level of the um, of the six nerves. So I'm just going to jump ahead here. You can see the vessels coming together here. At the end, uh, our clips come off. And here, a um, uh, final clip comes off. You see good flow in the ICA as it courses here. And so we've got this nice uh, ICA reconstruction. Looking at our postoperative angiogram, you can't even tell uh, that there was ever an aneurysm there. And it just goes to show. Um, the depth to which you can perform um, these kinds of IC, IC bypasses. So moving on to the intercerebral artery territory, um, you know, the ACA territory is um, um, one that um, I didn't do a lot of bypasses early in my career. You can see in 2015, we published this paper. Uh, it was 10 uh, ACA bypasses, and you can see the different um, 
types of bypasses as well. In the, in the years that followed that paper, uh, you can see that we more than doubled the number. We went from 10 to 23. And this table just shows you all the new variations of the bypasses in that territory. And as an example, um, here are some of the in situ variations. Because the pericolosal and colosal marginal and A3 segments are uh, right next to one another, you can bring them together in a variety of different ways. You can do colosal marginal to colosal marginal. You can do uh, A3 to A3. Uh, you can do pericolosal to pericolosal. You can do both in the form of a double bypass here. So um, a lot of different in situ options. Here's some pictures of some of those different combinations. Here's the colossal marginal to colossal marginal. Here's the A3 to colossal marginal with a little bit of size mismatch that you can compensate nicely for. Um, but you see the, the many different ways that you can bring together um, these, these vessels. Um, here is the, uh, the reimplantation technique. Once again, because they're side by side, you can cut the artery off one side, swing it over to the other side and do a nice reimplantation. Uh, you can see pericolosal to pericolosal, you can see colossal marginal to colossal marginal. And uh, over here, uh, you can see colossal marginal to pericolosal. So really kind of a, um, a vertical um, move or, or reimplantation. So um, here's some pictures of that. Here's a giant or near giant aneurysm. The artery gets cut off, it gets reimplanted on the opposite side, and we have a nice construct. I showed you in that earlier case the use of the A1 as a donor site. It's a phenomenal donor because, as you can see here, it's large in caliber. The ACOM allows for its temporary occlusion without any ischemic uh, ramifications, and it becomes this, uh, this beautiful donor. This is uh, yet another one of those. Uh, cases. I uh, won't show you the whole thing. I'll just show you the uh, use of this A1 as the donor. Here's uh, just another example of how it, it is a very deep bypass. Um, you're all the way down at the optic nerve, optic chiasm, but you can see it's a very um, nice donor vessel. Um, it allows you to use the base of the sylvian fissure as your working space for your donor rather than cutting down to the neck and bring in another site. Uh, here's an example of um, that A1 as a donor site. This is a giant ACOM. You can see it's mainly thrombus within this aneurysm. Uh, here we see um, the, um, uh, the fact that it's uh, got this small luminal component, mainly thrombus. Action angiogram and 3D reconstructed angiogram. You can see that. And um, so here for this one, what we're going to do is um, we're going to do a, what I call a squeeze play. We're going to do both a uh, bifrontal craniotomy and this uh, standard uh, terional craniotomy all in one. And by doing uh, the two in one, we can, um, we can bring this uh, together. So what we're, what we're going to do, this is the, the anatomy of this aneurysm with an A1 inflow, an ACOM, and the outflow through the A2s. In order to deconstruct this, we're going to have to put in a bypass to uh, reconstruct our inflow. That's going to be an M2 to A2 bypass. We're going to reconstruct the ACOM with an A3 to A3 in situ bypass. And then we're going to um, have our outflow vessels be the A3 segments rather than the A2s. So um, here's what that schematic looks like. Here's the bypass code for the bypass, uh, showing our, 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 um, our code up here in this alphanumeric string. And uh, this is the case. So here is the view down the Sylvian Fisher. As we um, do our squeeze play, you see that um, we've got our inner hemispheric fissure exposed here for the AC, ACA bypass. And we've also got our sylvian fissure exposed. So here is just the uh, A3 to A3 portion of the bypass. These are the pericolosal vessels that come together nicely. Our clips go on. We make our linear arteriotomies. We can do that intraluminal suture line here. 
very um, nice uh, tissues here to work with in this gentleman. And uh, we essentially are relocating our ACOM here uh, distally in the inner hemispheric fissure. So this is our IC green showing uh, good flow. And now we turn our attention down to the aneurysm. Here's the A1 coming in. Here's the recurrent artery of Huebner in between. And this is the A2 coming out. Our aneurysm is all the way back in here. So um, this is not one that uh, would be easy to clip. Uh, it would require thrombectomy. It would require um, a very difficult clip reconstruction. So here we're completing our bypass. This is now the A2 recipient site as it leaves the aneurysm. Here's our graft coming in and we can sew in that, um, that artery here. This is um, our suture technique. So a thick radial artery graft, we finish that up. Here's the, uh, the other suture line here. And now as, as we complete this, we now can run the graft to the sylvian fissure. So here now is the M2. This is gonna be our donor site. Once again, it's gonna be an intraluminal suture technique. So I'm sewing inside both of these two arteries, running continuous suture, which I, I like because it's quicker. This allows us to shorten the graft. We complete that, bring the other uh, artery wall together here. And now we've got the other end of our inner position graft done. So this completes the uh, M2 to A2 bypass. We can come off with our clips. And now you see uh, the completed bypass here. And um, now what I'm gonna show you is um, the endocyanine green run. And the important thing here is to look at the recurrent artery of Huebner, because um, here we're gonna trap our, um, our ACOM aneurysm complex with a clip on the distal A1, the second clip on the proximal A2 to keep the flow from the bypass going into the aneurysm. And that's gonna force the flow through the bypass and around to the A3, A3 bypass, and then down to the other side. And in between them is the recurrent artery of Huber. The only way for that to fill is through our bypass circuit, which goes over the top and around the other side. So there's the overview. And if you look here at the IC green, and if you look very carefully right in between here, at my arrow, you can see the recurrent artery of Huebner filling very nicely, which means that our circuit is intact and our flow has been uh, replaced by the bypass. So here's what it looks like. Here's our purple um, interposition bypass from the A, sorry, from the M2 to the A2. Flow goes up the um, A2 through the A3, A3 bypass and down and around to the other side. And in the meantime, continues to supply the territory distally. So we've reconstructed the entire ACA territory. We've isolated the aneurysm and uh, uh, the aneurysm is uh, completely gone. There are other ACA bypasses. These are some examples. This is the Azagas bypass, a similar idea where you've got um, a, uh, an inner position graft that um, donates blood flow and you've got two reimplants distally to, uh, to supply all of the outflow vessels. So this is just a, a little illustration that summarizes um, the uh, 10 bypasses done early in my career, the, all the different variations done since, and again, using our uh, blueprints and our codes for the variations of these techniques. Now, the next thing I wanna talk about is uh, this idea of the fourth generation bypass. And um, that case I showed you early on was a nice uh, example of that. You know, um, here is that case. Um, this first anastomosis, you could view this as a reimplantation. But if you think about most reimplantations, those are uh, end to side anastomoses. And yet we did a side to side reimplantation. So it raises the question what is this? Is this really a reimplantation or is this a, um, an in situ bypass? The same could be said of the other end of that bypass. You can see that it was sewn with that intraluminal technique. So is it an in situ bypass or is it a reimplantation? Well, um, what this case demonstrates is how uh, we're kind of blurring the lines between our usual way of thinking about these bypasses. 
And if we think about these as different, as their own separate entity, the, what I call the fourth generation bypass, then we can think about um, them in a different way. The, the type 4A bypass is a conventional construct sewn in a different way. So this is that intraluminal end to side anastomosis, as you can see in this picture. That would be a type 4A. A type 4B would be an unconventional construct. It would be that side to side reimplantation where instead of using an end to side, we're using a side to side. And, and so that first anastomosis becomes a type 4B. So we have a new way of thinking about our constructs. And when we do that, we can take our seven bypasses and we, we see that there are different options within each of these intracranial techniques. And so we're, we're expanding the way that we think about uh, bypass surgery and opening up new options. So I'll show you some examples of that. Um, this uh, first example is um, an example of reanastomosis. And um, you, know, you can do a reanastomosis with a simple third generation way, which is to excise the aneurysm and bring the ends together with an end to end. You can also do it uh, in a type 4A way. This is the fourth generation where if the vessels can't mobilize to sew around the, the, the circumference of the artery, then you can do this intraluminal technique. And it's a, a different technique, same anastomosis, but it becomes a 4A. And then this type 4B is when you use a completely different type of anastomosis. So um, here's an example. This is, um, uh, this is a uh, pica dissecting aneurysm. And you can see the uh, aneurysm here. And um, the traditional way would be to just uh, trap the aneurysm and bring these ends together. But um, if you look really carefully, um, what I found on this case was that there are a lot of perforators right around this segment, which I didn't want to move. You can see them uh, in here. And so rather than move the, uh, art, uh, the aneurysm and jeopardize these perforators, I'm going to do an end to side uh, reanastomosis rather than your traditional end to end. So I've cut the stump of the pica. I'm going to drop it down to this distal pica. And I'll just quickly uh, go to the end here. You can see how. Uh, we're doing this reanastomosis here. Instead of an end to end way, we're doing it with an end to side. So you can see it's a variation in the type of construct. So it makes this a type 4B and it achieves the same end. You can see good flow in the pica uh, on the other side of this uh, uh, anastomosis. And we leave the aneurysm and its perforators isolated here, but with those perforators intact. Um, I'm going to show you this one here. This is an example of a middle communicating artery. So for this one, what we have here is a very dolichoectatic middle cerebral artery bifurcation aneurysm. There's actually a trifurcation here with two trunks coming out the back and one trunk coming out the front. Uh, the first step is just a simple double barrel MCA bypass using the temporal arteries. And then here's the key. Once the, the double barrel bypass is in place, we can free these stumps of the trunks, we can bring them together, and this creates our middle communicating artery right here. What that allows is for the uh, bypasses to then redistribute their flow as needed uh, through the communicating artery. So these are just the STA MCA bypasses. There's nothing fancy about this portion of the case. Uh, but as we bring these together, what you see is the recipients are huge, the donors are quite small, and it would be helpful to then uh, allow the flow to decide for itself how it's going to redistribute itself. So here, once the two bypasses are in, we see good patency. We can now uh, trap the aneurysm proximally. These are our trapping clips going on. And once those are in place, we can now cut these trunks off of the aneurysm. Here's one trunk. Here's the other trunk. We can cut those both off of the aneurysm. And now we can bring them together with an end-to-end -end reimplantation. So we're doing an end-to-end -end reimplantation of one of the trunks onto the other of the two trunks. You can also see it's an intraluminal suture line. So it's a type 4A in addition to a type 4B. 
but this creates our middle communicating artery and it allows each of these two bypasses here, each of these two temporal arteries to now fill the middle cerebral territory and the flow can go in whatever direction it wants. This is our MCOM. This is our flow pattern. You can see the two bypasses feeding into it. And that flow can go in any direction that it wants. And uh, this patient did very well. Um, and uh, uh, it, it's a nice, uh, a nice uh, construct. Here's another example. Uh, this is uh, another MCOM. Uh, this uses the A1 as, um, oops, this is the one I've already shown you. Let me show you this one. This uses the A1 as the, uh, the donor vessel. So uh, here's the aneurysm, very dysmorphic bifurcation aneurysm. And uh, here's the angiography. And in this um, next sequence, the uh, animation, you'll see how this comes together. We're going to use the A1 over here as our donor vessel. Uh, we'll trap the, uh, the uh, aneurysm um, uh, distally. Here's the graph from A1 to M2. And once the aneurysm is trapped, we can create our middle communicating right there. So here's an overview of the aneurysm. You can see one trunk here. You can see the inflow here coming to the aneurysm. Here's the other trunk coming out of the aneurysm. And now um, we're doing our A1 anastomosis. So this is our donor site. This is our recipient site over on the M2, which uh, uh, I've uh, just shown you the uh, completed product. So now we've got our bypass in place. And now we can uh, transect each of those two trunks off of the aneurysm. Uh, we can uh, then bring them together end to end. So this is an, again an end to end reimplantation. <clears throat> you can see how friable these arteries are. And I think the trick for this uh, particular case was just bringing these arteries together. There's a little bit of tension on the arteries. Here the aneurysm is cut free. We've got our two stumps over here and we've got to work those ends together with our uh, first suture. But uh, let me move this along here. This completes the anastomosis. You can see right there, our completed anastomosis. Here's our IC green showing our flow. And, um, and this uh, really nicely uh, reconstructs the, uh, the bifurcation with this intracranial jump graft. So here, once again, the overview, and uh, here we can see the, um, the construct at the end. So these are the examples of the middle communicating artery. Here is that double barrel with the MCOM here. This was the um, uh, A1 uh, donor site here with the end-to-end -end reimplantation over here. This is the construction of the code, bringing all those different elements together. And you can see here, this, these are the alphanumerics here. So if you were a computer science engineer and you were designing code for these bypasses, this is your code. And that explains everything that you would need to do. So um, uh, I've talked about ICA bypass. I've talked about ACA bypass. I've talked about fourth generation bypass. I've talked about middle communicating artery bypass. Um, these are all examples of how we can take um, a craft, a piece of our practice, and push it further. Um, I think the way that this continues onward is to uh, continue to imagine new bypasses. This is a table that just has um, a list of things that uh, I've thought of doing. I haven't actually done all these, uh, but these are on the list of things to try and to see if they uh, can uh, provide a good solution for a particular aneurysm. Um, before we do these in, in real live patients, we go to the lab, we try them out in cadavers, we see if we've got the exposure, we see if the arteries have the stretch to reach their targets, and we try it and we see. Uh, I call these the dream bypasses because these are things that we can dream up and, uh, and then um, take to the operating room. So here's an example of uh, one of those cases. You, sometimes the um, 
the variant anatomy just gives you an opportunity that you can take advantage of. And in this particular case, what we see here is um, a dual origin pica with one extradural origin here and one intradural origin here. They come together and the aneurysm is downstream. And so for this case, we can take advantage of one of those limbs here as, in, as its own natural jump graft. So we can repurpose that uh, limb as a jump graft around this aneurysm and do an end to side reimplantation. So here's, uh, here's an example of that. Here's the anatomy. Uh, you can see on this animation how the aneurysm is distal to the dual origin. So what we'll do is we'll trap the um, aneurysm, we'll swing that um, extracranial origin of pica over to the distal pica, and we'll do an enticide reanastomosis. And now we've got a natural reconstruction. So this is the construct that we're going to make. And here it is uh, at surgery. So these are the two uh, pikas coming together. This is their confluence here. Our aneurysm is right here. And like with most of these bypass cases, what I like to try and do first is to clip them. It's obviously much quicker and much easier just to clip. But what you see here is that this aneurysm tissue is friable. We've got an intraoperative rupture here. So we have to escalate to the bypass. So our temporary clips go on. As we look at the pathology, it's just a hole in the artery there. So um, here now is that proximal uh, segment of pica. I'm going to cut it free from the vertebral artery. I'm going to repurpose that. And I'm going to uh, move it over to the distal pica around the backside of the aneurysm. You can see I fish mouth the artery. And I'm going to do this end to side anastomosis. So I don't need to do any harvest. I don't need to do any uh, occipital artery dissection. Uh, I just uh, uh, use that uh, extra vessel there. And you can see at the end here, this endocide anastomosis here very nicely uh, reperfuses the distal pica. Here, the aneurysm has been uh, isolated and transected out. And we've got a nice, uh, uh, a nice finish. Um, this is another example just uh, showing um, how we deal with some of these more difficult aneurysms. This is, this is a uh, thrombotic holobasilar aneurysm. And for this one, I did a uh, M2-P2 bypass. I opened up the aneurysm. I gutted it of its thrombus and took the, uh, the mass effect away. So here is, um, I'll just quickly show you this one. This is the transsylvian dissection. We can go all the way down here to the P2. Uh, this is an M2 P2 bypass. This is our radial artery graft. So as this goes in, um, this essentially creates flow to the upper basilar. So here is um, sewing into the P2 segment with the radial artery. We'll finish that first. Then we'll come up to the uh, MCA. This is the MCA. So this is our donor site in the Sylvian fissure. Our endocyanine green shows we've got a nice flow down to the basilar apex through the graft. And now we can turn our attention to this transcochlear exposure. So this is now going infratentorial uh, through the petrous bone. And as we open the dura, our aneurysm comes into view here. So this is our giant aneurysm. We're going to expose the um, inflow and the outflow of arteries here. You can see this is the vertebral basilar junction. So what I'm going to do here, I'm going to um, use um, rapid ventricular pacing. So by um, uh, accelerating the, the heart rate, you can see the aneurysm softens. We can dissect the sixth nerve off of the front of this aneurysm. We can soften the aneurysm and reduce its flow. And um, that allows me to place clips on the two vertebral arteries and on the distal basilar artery so that this aneurysm is completely isolated or near completely isolated. I can now open the aneurysm with this incision here. The aneurysm itself is filled with thrombus. So we're going to do a CUSA thrombectomy. 
And you can see how um, by getting inside the aneurysm, we have the opportunity to um, essentially uh, turn this tumor, which is compressing the, the pons and the brainstem into, a, into an empty sac. You can see here at the very depths, the contralateral ica is still filling. I haven't been able to reach that, but because of our rapid ventricular pacing, we can minimize that flow. Now the aneurysm folds in on itself. You can see how we can bring the walls together. We can placate this with, um, with our clips. And now we're taking the mass effect out of this aneurysm by closing the aneurysm down again after removing all of the thrombus. So this is basically um, a uh, brainstem decompression using bypass to, uh, to do that for us. And here, um, oops. Here at the end, you can see uh, closure of the basilar circulation and replacement with our M2P2 bypass. Uh, I wanted to show you one last case. Um, um, this idea of uh, brainstem compression with large arteries um, has led to this um, idea of macrovascular decompression. So in other words, when you have um, arteries that compress the brainstem like this one, one of the ways to make patients better and relieve symptoms is to move the artery. And uh, the way that um, I've come to uh, appreciate doing this best is by pulling the artery forward against the clivus where it naturally belongs. You don't wanna pull the artery uh, towards you as you approach it. Um, you wanna actually move it back into the position where it started. And so to do that, um, I find this lasso to be really nice. You can uh, anchor that to the clival dura with an aneurysm clip, feeding the tail of the lasso through the clip and uh, securing it to the clival dura. And, um, and that's one way to deal with these aneurysms. But I wanted to show you this case, which involves bypass. And in this one, we have so much redundant artery here that um, uh, moving the artery is not gonna be sufficient. Uh, so what we're gonna do is what we call a, a binder ring bypass. And so here, as we come on this artery, you can see this redundant tissue is, is impinging on the nerve. And so we're, just moving the artery forward is not gonna be enough here. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna transect the artery after we trap it, this, this redundant artery is all V4 uh, vertebral artery. So we can transect the artery. We can reroute it on the outside of the seventh and eighth nerve complex. So here the ends of the artery now are being fed on the outside and we can bring them back together here lateral to the, the nerve bundle. And we can um, essentially do an end-to-end -end reanastomosis here. So this is a, um, an end-to-end -end reconstruction, but now the artery is on the outside of the seventh and eighth nerve complex. So this patient's symptoms are going to get better, did get better, because there's no longer any nerve compression. The artery is rerouted outside of the nerve and the nerve is, is free. So we're sewing this together with this uh, intraluminal suture line on the back wall the extra luminal suture line here on the front wall. And you can see how this uh, nicely reconstructs itself. The uh, nerve bundle is now inside the vascular loop. We can come off with our clips. And now we've eliminated the vascular compression. This is the vertebra basilar junction. This is the end-to-end -end reanastomosis. And this patient's symptoms resolve completely. So it's an example of how uh, you can achieve a macrovascular decompression using bypass technique. So um, I'm gonna finish here now. Um, I just wanna show you a few more slides for some closing thoughts. Uh, I showed you this graph at the very beginning of my talk. Uh, this is a graph that uh, is um, very depressing, very discouraging for those of us uh, who love doing aneurysm surgery. But if you look at these graphs here, um, one of these curves, the green line here is the bypass curve. 
And you can see that's a very healthy curve. This line is going up, not down. Uh, so there is uh, cause for hope. Um, and um, you know, I hope what this lecture has uh, uh, impressed upon you is that um, we, we don't need high technology. We don't need um, fancy gadgets. We can do so much just with simple suture and our own creativity. And that's really um, what I love about bypass surgery. It's a manual craft. And if we just use our heads and we um, be creative, uh, we can really expand the field and uh, promote this evolution. Um, I like to think of it as uh, hands, head, and heart. You know, this is, this is tough surgery. Uh, it requires um, a lot of dexterity and technical skill. Um, I think all of us need to appreciate that it's um, um, difficult uh, work and you don't want to jump into something like this. But um, it's also important to recognize that it's a, it's a very heady, heady uh, surgery. You have to think through your strategy. You have to be creative. Uh, some of these tools like the uh, blueprint symbols and the, the alphanumerics allow you to work through some of that strategy and be creative um, and, and capture those ideas as you go. And lastly, you know, it really takes, um, uh, it, it really takes heart. Um, these are tough cases. They don't always go uh, as well as you would like them to. Uh, and it really demands perfection. So I think we all need to um, strive for that perfection and, uh, and work hard at this. So with that, I'm going to stop. Um, these are my concluding thoughts. Um, Yuha, thank you so much for uh, having me here. And uh, uh, I really appreciate seeing you and being part of this uh, uh, series that you've created. Thank you very much, Michael. Wonderful lecture, wonderful skills. Before giving the word to Subin, I will quote Francis Bacon, the politician and uh, writer 400 years ago. Every man owes it as a debt to his profession to put on record whatever done that might be used to others. And this is very important, what you so told in the beginning of the lecture, writing down your experience. This is extremely important. I feel so pity here in China that the great skills are not written down and published. And I try to promote and encourage Chinese neurosurgeons to publish with minimal uh, results until now, but I hope they will publish the huge series here. So I hope Subin will encourage them. And now I give the word to Subin to speak about the Bible's lecture. Please go ahead. Thank you very much, Michael. Thank you, Professor Lawton. I really enjoy your presentation and uh, I learned a lot from your presentation. So, <clears throat> Just as you mentioned, actually uh, uh, tonight, uh, I think uh, there, are, uh, there were 2000 audience uh, watched your presentation. Mm -hmm. So actually uh, uh, a huge star in, chi in China, you know, uh, uh, Professor Yuha and uh, in last weekend, uh, in the Chinese uh, Congress of Neuroso uh, Neuro Neurosurgical Congress, uh, we have a right clip, right clipping competition in the young neurosurgeons, and uh, uh, the the top seven, uh, the top ten, maybe five uh, of them, they use uh, bypass technique in reconstruct the. Uh, visitors. Actually, uh, a lot of them uh, quote, uh, quoted your books. <laughs> so good. I'm happy to hear that. Well, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I, I, um, I think you uh, um, emphasized a very good point. You know, um, uh, we we learn um, and we get our inspiration through all the cases we do. And I'm so envious of the volume that uh, the Chinese neurosurgical community has. It's, um, 
Uh, it must be a remarkable stimulus to come up with new ideas and to write great papers. Um, you know, I, I, you and I have often uh, joked, I, you, you do more bypasses in one year than I do in uh, tw uh, 20 years. So I'm always been, I've always been jealous of uh, the volume that you have and the opportunity that you have there in Shanghai to do uh, great work and um, so many bypasses. Thank you. Actually, uh, you know, I'm the hybrid neurosurgeon, so uh, I also do the interventional treatment. So most of the posterior circulation aneurysms, we use uh, interventional uh, treatment. So don't, I don't have so many experience in the posterior uh, uh, aneurysms to use a by bypass technique. Uh, I have a question about you because uh, in my mind, uh, I think the M1 to M2 segment uh, giant aneurysm is maybe the most difficult ones because some uh, perforators, if you use a proximal occlusion or distal occlusion, actually you couldn't make sure to keep the patency of the small perforators. So uh, what's your st strategy to keep this uh, kind of uh, small perforators uh, patent in treat these giant aneurysms? Yeah, I agree with you. The, the M1 aneurysm is a very difficult one to, uh, to do because um, there are a couple of uh, spots on the circulation that have um, these uh, vital perforators that don't tolerate temporary occlusion. The M1 is one of those. The P1 is another one of those. Um, these are territories where you simply cannot um, take the 20 minutes for a bypass anastomosis and get away with it in many cases. So um, I've done um, very few M1 bypasses. I, I have one here I can show you, but um, uh, it was an M1 to M2 bypass. But in that case, I first did an STA-MCA bypass. I um, d uh, vascularized um, one of the distal trunks with the STA, very much like Tanakawa does. And then I put in my uh, inner position graft and the, the STA bypass provided some protection as I was sewing in the proximal end of that um, radial artery to the M1. It was an end-to-end -end anastomosis. And, um, and I think you, you really do have to be um, protective of those little perforators, those end arteries that don't have any uh, collateral uh, supply. So um, I tend to do my bypasses um, away from those areas. The, um, I think you noticed in, uh, in my talk, I put my MCA bypasses out at the M2 segments, um, really not at the M1 segment. The one exception to that uh, that I allow myself is the A1. Uh, and you saw that repeatedly. I, I showed a couple of those cases. The A1 does have uh, uh, these delicate perforators, but um, they go to the antiperforate substance, and it's the essentially the um, the globus pallidus and the innominate substantia, substantia innominata of the frontal lobe. So if there's maybe one trapped per perforator, um, uh, you can reperfuse it, and it clinically has not been a relevant problem. Uh, I haven't even seen infarcts from the temporary occlusion, but I don't think that's the case with the lenticulostrites because those go to the uh, internal capsule and more eloquent areas. Yes, thank you. So uh, I noticed that uh, in some vessels, there's some uh, atherosclerotic plaque uh, on the vessel wall. Uh, but uh, I noticed that you, maybe you don't care this break and still do the bypass directly. So it, do you have some special treatment for this kind of break? Um, yeah, I think a little bit of plaque is okay. Um, mm -hmm. there's, there's always going to be some atherosclerotic change um, that um, is okay that you can sew through, but uh, there are others where the plaque is so thick that you first have to do an endarterectomy. Um, um, 
I have one beautiful case where I was using the V3 segment as a donor and I incised um, the artery. I did my arteriotomy and there was so much plaque that I had to end arterectomize the vert before sewing in the graft. So um, I would say that if the plaque looks ugly enough that you need an end arterectomy first, you can do that. Um, I worry though, because if you roughen up the edges um, with an end arterectomy, uh, you know, it, it could um, compromise patency of the graft. So I, I think um, you have to choose it carefully. If, if there's a choice that can be made and you can select your um, anastomosis site away from plaque, then I think that's uh, worthwhile. But I think the case that, that stuck in your mind was that A2 uh, anastomosis. And in that case, you know, you really have one shot. There's only one place you can go. And if there's plaque there, you just have to go there. Great. Thank you. So uh, I think it's a very uh, useful technique to make a, a, a M2 uh, intercommunicating uh, <laughs> stoma. So, uh, but I think this is uh, very useful for the uh, for the uh, for different size of the donor artery. Uh, uh, yeah. For example, if the uh, one branch is uh, much bigger than the another one, mm -hmm. so th they can distribute the <clears throat> blood flow into the intercommunicating uh, artery you created. So, but how about the uh, if the, the size and the uh, is uh, similar? Is it still uh, you, uh, necessary to create this intercommunicate at the you know, stoma? Yeah, that's a good question. I think if um, if there was good caliber matching between mm -hmm. the donor and the recipients, and you felt like each of the two SDAs was sufficient to supply the um, the trunk, then you probably don't need it. But here's the beauty of it. Um, there's no ischemia time in doing that end-to-end -end anastomosis. You've already put in the bypasses and um, they're doing their thing while you're sewing. So there's no ischemia. So there's really no price that you pay by simply bringing them together. And if there is a benefit, then you gain the benefit without any risk. So that was um, that's one of the things that goes through my mind. Um, in doing that bypass, it, is there is there a risk? Is there a price to pay for the patient? And in in this case, the answer is no. So why not just do it? So um, that's the nice thing. But um, do you have to do it? No, uh, you don't have to do it. Um, in some cases, um, 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 you do have to do it. Like that um, that recurrent aneurysm, you, you really do need to create that communicating artery to get the flow from the high flow graph over to the other trunk. So there you need the communication to, to make that work. Um, but in the double barrel example, you don't need that necessarily. Yeah, I noticed that you uh, uh, when you make the stoma, actually uh, in uh, some even end to side, you still you use some intraluminal uh, in, uh, intraluminal uh, stitching technique. Yeah. So is this uh, because of the depth of the surgical fear and uh, or other yeah, some um, special so, consideration? Um, what, what I noticed is when when you have um, um, the traditional technique, you usually sew one side and then you flip flop the artery over in the other direction to sew the other. So you need a lot of movement of the graft like this. Mm -hmm. And um, what, what that means is that your graft ends up being much longer than it would otherwise. If you just could leave the, the graft in one spot, um, you could shorten it and make it really, really snug and then do all of your sewing from the inside and the outside. So the advantage of that technique is it takes a graft that maybe is this long and allows it to be this long um, without the need for that movement and then it's a much cleaner graph, which I think will ultimately stay open uh, with a higher percentage. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, Manuel Encarnacion, you have a comment or question? Manuel? Uh, yeah, hello, John. Hello, thank you. Uh, uh, first of all, it's a great honor, uh, Professor Lotto, a great honor. 
Thank you. Uh, my name is Manuel Encarnacion. I am from Dominican Republic, but I am making my residence program in, in Moscow. Uh, my question is about the learning curve in the in the bypass technique, because in, in my country, in Dominican Republic, nobody's doing that. So which way you think is the best way to decrease the learning curve? Because uh, I practice with, with rats or chicken wings. So uh, after that, because it's not the, the anatomy is it's not the same anatomy, uh, we create uh, a device, a model, uh, a brain model with the vessels, since the superficial temporal artery, the skin, the, the full uh, skull, the brain, and the willy stopos, all in one of one real size to try to decrease the learning curve. So what to think about the, the models? Or try to, to learn bypass. Yeah, um, well, so here's my answer. Uh, it's very simple. Um, bypass is one of those things that you can learn in the lab and you can develop your skills to a very high level uh, without ever having to do a real surgery on a patient. Um, I can tell you from experience, when I was a resident, I um, did my research year doing um, carotid to jugular fistulas for venous hypertension for a, a dural AVM model. And um, I, I learned my bypass skills um, there before I ever did a, a bypass on a real patient. So um, I, I think you can take your, your skills to a very high level just by practicing on rats and in chickens like you had mentioned. Um, we, we created a product that's not yet commercially available, but um, it basically is... Um, Every, every case in um, seven bypasses in the book, um, we, not every case, but representative cases, we, we made um, <laughs> physical models. So you can actually do the same case that I did and showed in the book uh, in the model because it's, we, we have the computer um, uh, studies from the patients and we built with 3D printers the same configurations and you can test yourself. You can put yourself in the exact same position that I was in when I sewed that particular bypass on page 200, you know, and, and, and you can essentially um, um, test yourself with the same confines. And, and I think um, there are opportunities like that to really um, simulate the surgery so beautifully in a lab setting and allow yourself to get through the learning curve quickly. Um, it's not the same for aneurysms or AVMs, there, there is no substitute for actually doing the dissection and dissecting out an AVM or tackling the bleeding problems. Um, there, you, you really have to have the live patient. But for bypass, you know, the, um, the actual 20 minutes that you spend sewing that anastomosis is the same, whether you're in the lab or in the patient. Uh, well, uh, I would like to to, to show you or send to you one of the models and, and you can give your opinion because uh, I already sent one to Professor Juha, but um, have some problem with the delivery uh, and, and see your opinion. In the, because we make um, a bleeding skin, we call it bleeding skin. In the skin of our model, uh, if you make the incision, you're gonna have the superficial temporal artery and you can make the bypass from the superficial temporal artery to cerebral media artery. Okay. okay very good. Yeah. Yuha, Yuha, do you have any comments? Okay. Yeah, the, if there is in the audience is some questions or comments to Michael? Yeah, I think Natalie has a comment. Natalie, go ahead, Natalie. Natalie. Uh, good morning. Um, Thank you, uh, Dr. Lotton, amazing um, lecture. I have three questions. The first one is, uh, what is the protocol that use you in a preoperative time, intraoperative and postoperative time, um, uh, respect about uh, the use of aspirin, heparin, or other medicines that can help you? Uh, the second one is, um, what is the technical things that uh, you uh, think that uh, can be the reason of the file 
of a bypass um, that we can prevent. And the third one is if you, in the first time when you were, when you was uh, starting your career, uh, you have a um, file with bypass um, in, and what was the conduct that you do, uh, you did. For example, or reopen the anastomosis or change the plan and do other, other connection, other bypass. Um, sorry for my English. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Um, so the first question about um, what what do I do medically to um, prevent thrombosis? Well, um, I I do not heparinize patients. Um, I, I think that's too much. Um, I don't give aspirin in advance um, because I like the platelets to help me uh, seal the bypass. I immediately start aspirin postoperatively and for life thereafter. So, so I do um, uh, just really rely on the aspirin. Um, I, I've had two tough cases this year um, where despite doing perfect surgery and, and um, you know, the, the bypass was initially fine, I, I struggled on both cases to keep the, the bypass open. And I think um, there are probably a handful of patients out there that um, have some abnormal clotting disorder that doesn't show up on the normal PT, PTT, or uh, doesn't show up on the normal tests. And I think um, doing these uh, TAG studies um, might be a way to identify the troublesome patients in advance. So that's something that we've started to do. Um, I think your question about troubleshooting the bypass is a difficult one because, um, you know, if you do bypass surgery, you will inevitably have complications where um, you finish and the bypass isn't flowing and you've got to troubleshoot it. And um, there's so many different tricks to troubleshoot the bypass. Um, sometimes you get just a little platelet aggregation, a little white, white plug is what I call it. And the white plugs can be broken apart and um, freed from the suture line. And you can simply save it by physically manipulating that. There are other cases where you know the white plug turns into a red plug with clot formation. And there's just simply no way you're gonna um, salvage that without redoing the bypass. There are ways to take it down partially. There are ways to take it down completely. Um, and I think it really depends on you know, what you're dealing with and you just got to work your way through that. Um, I, I, I think it's a whole nother topic, uh, almost, uh, I could give almost another lecture on that, but um, there's a lot of discussion of that in seven bypasses, if you want to read some details. Um, but I think those are the real critical moments, you know, when everything goes well, um, it's easy to feel great about bypass surgery, but I think you, you have to be prepare, prepared for those moments where it doesn't go well and you've got to troubleshoot or, you know, even worse, if you're struggling to just sew the, the anastomosis in, uh, particularly on a deep bypass, you, you make a commitment as soon as you cut into those arteries. And as soon as you initiate the process, you, you've committed uh, yourself and you've got to fight your way through um, the, uh, the whole process of suturing the anastomosis and completing it and getting to the finish line. Dr. Kupta. Uh, good evening, sir. So there's no question. I just uh, was uh, find time, finding time for my moment to congratulate Dr. Lawton, sir, on his achievement of 5,000 aneurysms clipping. That is uh, very inspiring to us. Sir. Thank you. Thank you for saying yeah, that. I appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Okay, you have Michael okay. starting his day here. So, uh, do you want yeah. to wrap it up? You yeah. wrap Thank it you up? very much, Michael. It was a wonderful lecture, and we enjoyed it very much. We learned very much, like Subin was saying. So, we certainly learned. And this is extremely high level of microneurosurgery you are doing. So, so it is a long way to learn everything what you are telling. And the most important message for the Chinese neurosurgeons, Japanese neurosurgeons, is write down your experience, publish, and publish in English. This is very important because when writing down your experience, publishing, it makes you by far better surgeon. 
because you analyze your cases and you will get creative. So I thank you all for a great evening and uh, have a good day or good night in East. So thank you very much. Bye bye. You, you, okay. you, uh, thank you so much and uh, congratulations to you for what you're doing, not only with this webinar, but uh, in uh, going to China and teaching and inspiring the Chinese neurosurgical community. My hat goes off to you. Okay, thanks everybody. We'll Sir, see, you, see you next uh, week. Last, uh, qu last question. Uh, okay, last go, question ahead. go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. Uh, my Chinese Greek, they, uh, they are discussing in the uh, uh, WeChat. Uh, they said that the MBD, uh, the uh, bypass technique uh, used in the MBD is a very creative uh, technique. And uh, how many cases uh, do you uh, treat in this? Uh, oh. Um, very, few. Um, very few. The the uh, the bypass option for macrovascular decompression is um, what I call a treatment of last resort. So, um, microvascular decompression you can pad the uh, the nerve. Macrovascular decompression the sling is the go to, and the bypass is really only when everything else fails. So, um, very few cases I. Um, we're, we're publishing that um, that concept, but um, you know we, we're very clear uh, when we publish that uh, that it's it's really for a last resort because if you lose an artery, um, it's it's difficult. Um, you, it's a big risk to take, so you just have to use it uh, only when all other things fail. So, uh, do you uh, use some uh, blue occlusion test to? to make sure that your temporal clip couldn't cause some uh, yeah. deficit. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, so in that case, the compression mm -hmm. was at the V4, from the V4 uh, segment. It was not from the basilar. And so okay. the contralateral vertebral artery was sufficient to carry the flow during the uh, occlusion time. So um, you need to make sure that that's present. If that okay. were a basilar occlusion, then you would need an occlusion test to be mm -hmm. sure. Okay, thank you again. You're welcome. Okay, very good. Thank you for your fantastic presentation. Bye-bye. Great to see you. Th yeah, thanks thank for, you. The thanks for the translation and thanks for the Kashi. Thank you for thank Japanese you. translation. Thank you. Uh, Major Lotton, the very informative lectures. Uh, we do simply STMCA and SCA and OA biker, but a new type of your uh, VIPAS procedure is very informative and we learn a lot about it thank you so much okay very we'll, welcome. okay we'll see you next week everybody thank you thank you thank you very much thank you bye-bye